Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our program, a history and virtual tour of the New England Botanic Garden at Tower Hill. This program is part of our Beyond the Library series, which introduces attendees to the many fun and educational opportunities that our Museum Pass program offers. Currently, Cary Library has 23 discounted passes to a variety of wonderful places. My name is Helen Liu, and I'm the Programming and Partnerships Manager at Cary Library. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to thank the friends of Cary Library for sponsoring this program. I also want to thank the Ashland and Tuxbury Public Libraries for partnering with us today. This program is being recorded and will be posted to the library's YouTube channel. If you have any questions, please enter them into the Q&A. Now I'd like to welcome Teresa uh, to our program and she is going to share a little bit about herself. Welcome, Teresa. Hi. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, my name is Teresa Lee. I'm the Chief Development Officer at New England Botanic Garden at Tower Hill. That is a new name for us. Um, we previously were called Tower Hill Botanic Garden. Uh, if you've been here before, you might know that. Uh, we have been talking about that far and wide to our members and to our visitors. Uh, my background is actually in higher education and advancement at MIT, Boston College, uh, Worcester Polytechnic, and um, Holy Cross. And I live next door in Northborough, Massachusetts, and had an opportunity to, for the first time in my career, travel from a suburb to a suburb to go to work. And I am thrilled to be able to do that and to come to such a beautiful place every day. My department oversees the membership that I'll be talking about and um, fundraising. And we are a garden on the rise here and our new name reflects that. Thank you. And so before uh, Teresa begins with the tour, we are going to uh, share a video. So I'm going to share that now. Just one note about the video is that it is a few years old, so things gonna, are gonna look a little different, but it is a great overview to start with. Great. I think that sometimes people are intimidated by the idea of a botanic garden because it does sound like a really big word. We know that not everyone is a botanist. One thing we try to do is appeal to many different groups by having an amazing collection of classes and events throughout the year. The exciting thing about the programs here is that they range from early, early, preschool, all the way up through the graduate levels. Our goal is to teach them about plants and plant parts, plant structures, the reproduction of plants, pollination and pollinators, and all of those wonderful things. But primarily, we're able to do that in this environment. So I've always been a hands-on educator because I think we reach more children, more learning styles. We help them to access more what's happening in the natural world. And it seems like a simple thing, but children do need to have conversations about that. The kids are fantastic. We love having them here. And we just love to see their reactions when they come out to see the garden and see something that they have grown. <laughs> well, what's cool about them is that they first start out as a little caterpillar and then they just turn out as a butterfly. That's pretty cool. I love to come see these. We're doing a lot of outreach into the community, a lot of education programs within the schools themselves, so that you know, schools that may not be able to visit the gardens are able to learn about the environment as well. I was really indoors last year. Once I started doing this program, I really just like, I like going outside a lot more now. They learn about working in the landscape and seeing it transform before their eyes. They, may not even be able to necessarily describe in words what it does for them to be out here, but I think that that's invaluable for them. We also offer such a wide variety of adult programs, everything from yoga to tai chi to forest bathing to botanical illustration, plant ID. What we want to promote is people learning about horticulture in our gardens, but then also realizing that nature and horticulture is a place for fitness and wellness. 
one thing that I'm extremely proud of is our efforts to make this a garden for all. No matter the day, no matter where you're coming from, and no matter what's going on in your life, it is a place for you. Tower Hill has been so positive for me because they've encouraged me to stretch the boundaries. As I learned about my own condition, about losing my sight, I realized that I could teach other people as to what that feels like. One of the things that it impresses me about Tower Hill, how well the gardens are maintained here. Also, the, uh, the imagination they have in putting into gardens and how they develop and what goes into them. It's really amazing to see how the gardens are designed. We look around and we see different varieties of plants that capture our, our eye, not because of the specific little petal, but because of the overall view that we see here. We have an excellent horticulture team who are dedicated to the gardens, and it really is a great variety of skills that this team brings to us, and you can see the results. They are just masters at their craft. The garden is a beautiful place to come every single day, and after I volunteer, I walk the gardens and I take in the, the beauty that's here. But the garden also depends very heavily on the volunteers that are here. There are hundreds of volunteers, and they're an active part of this community. We could not open the doors of this garden without our volunteers. You'll see them everywhere. You'll see them at the front desk answering questions and answering phones and taking tickets. You'll see them stuffing envelopes and helping us with our annual fund. I find community here at Tower Hill, and it's a place for me to go where I can share my love of the gardens and also meet some really terrific people. There's so much that we can research and glean from healthy living, being outdoors, being in communion with one another, being in communion with nature. I just think this is a perfect example of what's possible. Wonderful, thank you. Um, well, we wanted to share the overview of the um, video with you so that you'd have a sense of what Tower Hill looks like and some of the programs and some of the voices of the people that are in our community here. And um, some of the things that you saw, particularly that last overview shot, if we did another drone shot at, from that angle, uh, you would not recognize the place because it has changed in the last five years. Featured in the video was our CEO, Grace Elton, who arrived at Tower Hill a little over five years ago. Um, I've been here a couple of years and I can tell you that uh, Grace is a catalyst. Sometimes people overuse the word visionary. That's, that's one aspect of her uh, skill set, but really a catalyst for change in, in the best ways. Um, physically, our campus has changed, and then who is arriving here at the garden and enjoying all that there is to enjoy here has changed significantly during her tenure. So I want to share a little bit about what the garden is all about its history, and then um, the kinds of programs and outreach that we're doing today, D dive a little deeper for you. Our mission, and this is um, a more recent rewritten mission during the pandemic, there was an opportunity for the board and the leadership to come together and reset and develop a strategic plan. And so the mission was updated. So we are a place that creates experiences with plants that inspire people and improve the world. We, we sit at the intersection of people and plants. That was the video. We began in 1842 in Worcester, in downtown Worcester, uh, at the Worcester County Horticultural Society, which is still our legal name, uh, at Horticulture Hall. For those of you that know Worcester, you know this now as the Worcester Historical Society. Um, which is housed in this building today. But initially, this is where the society met 
and did things like flower shows and plant shows and you know talked about the science of horticulture and so forth. But in the mid 80s, uh, 1980s, uh, the society began to really outgrow the space of the building in downtown Worcester and began to look for other places to be able to showcase all of the wonderful work that was being done. So came available um, a farm on Tower Hill, so named Tower Hill because there used to be a tower overlooking or up on this property that looked out onto the Wachusett Reservoir, which you can see in the distance there. Some people think that Tower Hill or uh, the Worcester County Historical, or sorry, Horticultural Society went a long way away. In fact, it's less than 11 miles from its original location. Um, but the tower on the hill there is no longer here, but we are originally renamed Tower Hill Botanic Garden and recently changed to the New England Botanic Garden at Tower Hill, um, really reflecting our growth and um, our audience as well. You can also, when you're on this property, see Wachusett Mountain in the distance. It kind of doesn't pop on this particular slide, but it's really stunning when you're coming up through the entrance. So this is the original farm. Um, I actually am sitting right in here. <laughs> That's my office. I'm privileged to work in the farm. And uh, you saw in the video people doing yoga. And this morning, people were out on the lawn garden doing yoga. I could hear them through my window. Um, this building, the farmhouse, still stands. We use it for administrative uh, offices. This building over here, the barn, is no longer there. That now is a conservatory, and we have many more buildings um, on the property. Uh, and it's expanded since the 1986 when we moved here. So what? let's bring us back to modern day. Here are the, some of the sites that you might see if you were to arrive here, including um, on the upper left, the inside of conservatory, um, down on the lower left, that is Marissa Gallant, who last night was named one of uh, Worcester's 40 under 40 for her work with youth education here at the garden. Um, and on the upper right, one of our most popular exhibitions uh, in the fall called Wicked Wings. And we had these wonderful giant wings all over the property. And it was a bit of a scavenger hunt for people to find them, but also lots of selfies and Instagram posts on the wings. This was out in the middle of our lawn garden. And then down on the lower right is an image from our night lights. And that is our most popular program and attracts uh, more than 60,000 visitors annually in the month of December. But you can see our visitation um, even during the pandemic, when we had to close our doors, um, has been rising uh, over the years and took a little hit in the middle there, but we are back up to uh, pre-pandemic visitation, which is wonderful. We did well during the pandemic and a lot of people I think found us for the first time because we are an outdoor space, um, unlike some museums. Now it's getting interesting with trends to see that because people can come back inside, they are, um, uh, you know, they have choices, but we work very hard to uh, not only attract membership, but also really uh, treat our members very, very well. There are a lot of wonderful benefits to being a member. You get discounts, you get reciprocal admission at other um, gardens all over the country and in North America and you get discount at local nurseries and in our garden shop and our, um, it's and you get pre-notice of things like nightlights, which is why I brought that up. Uh, we have over 10,400 members. That is of today, I checked this morning. And um, we also have a lot of programs for youth and adults. And in a typical year, we're seeing about 10,000 or more um, young people and adults come through here and take classes, whether those be out in the field or inside. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of that in a little bit of detail. I mentioned membership. Um, we have many levels of membership, and one of our goals is to remain accessible 
Our admission price, if you were just to show up here as an individual, would be $16. So we feel like our membership for those who um, are interested is quite affordable. If you plan on coming here at least four times a year, it begins to pay itself back. And then again, you get the discounts and reciprocal membership with other places. Um, dual is for two adults. So if you were, wanted to share that with a friend, you could, um, and then so forth and so on with family, friend, at each level, and you can look on our website, you begin to get more passes so that you can bring more people with you. And um, those last three begin to get into philanthropy. So our contributing, our supporting, and our John Green Society members, uh, not only are buying a membership, but they are contributing an annual gift at the same time. Our John Green Society, uh, we have about 100 uh, families in that or households in that. And we do very special events for them, behind the scenes uh, events. When we have new openings of exhibitions, we always have a party around that. In fact, we're having one next Wednesday. And it's a wonderful group of supporters that are very loyal, have been with us for a number of years. We're starting to see new members into that society. And um, they come to know one another and uh, really form a community of the most dedicated, uh, some volunteers and, and supporters. This is an overview of our parking lot. And why do I share that is because we have doubled, this is during construction, it looks much different right now. All of the uh, spaces that you see between the parking bays are now gardens and look much different. And the upper left is filled in with a nice meadow, but we doubled the size of our parking because we were attracting more and more visitors and members and so forth. And we added an, a garden that I'm gonna tell you about. This is the entryway. This was also re recently redone. It's a wonderful accessible walk. Um, we used to have some steps off to the left of this that you first entered and then made your way up. We got rid of the steps to again, make it universal for all to be able to access the garden. Um, sometimes we get a little feedback that people wanted the steps because it's a little quicker to get up and through, but really we were looking for accessibility that a wheelchair, uh, or anybody um, could get up to the gardens. That's what we mean when we say we are a garden for all. This is the entry into their Stoddard Education Center. And to the right is one of our conservatories uh, in that former picture that was the old barn uh, taken down and now we have two conservatories. And uh, we're just moving the plants back in. In the summertime, the plants come out and they um, are all in um, plant holders and they go around the garden uh, in different spots and then they bring them back in just about this time of year. Uh, it takes them about a week and a half to get everything back in. And the conservatories are, I can tell you, wonderful places to visit at the height of a New England winter. Um, you can come in and be very warm and surrounded by greenery and beautiful plants. And um, we are open year round and people do enjoy visiting. And we have programs year round as well. This is a new universal design um, accessible walkway. This is called Pliny's LA. If you've been here before, this was otherwise a grass walkway and now is wheelchair accessible. We built a uh, boardwalk here and instead of disturbing the wonderful trees that are there, um, the, the, the way that they installed it was to put diamond shaped um, supports that would go around the roots of the tree and support this beautiful walkway at the back of the Stoddard Center and leads you to our newest garden called the Ramble. This is not the design of the Ramble, although our CEO loves to say that when she was looking at designs, this is literally what the designer sketched out, um, you know, uh, the, art, the landscape architect sketched out. And this is actually um, a drone shot overview. And the features on this are wonderful. We have a central lawn where we can do youth programs. There are nice benches around. So if you bring your children or your grandchildren, you can sit and watch them play. We have drop-in activities for kids. Um, to the right, you see a pavilion. Under that are picnic tables. Um, we've had music out there, um, events. You can rent it for birthday parties. And it's just a covered place physically there at the garden. 
We not shown here is we do have a um, a restroom and a storage facility up there. And I, every time I tour this garden with people, I say that's the most genius thing as a mother myself, rather than to go all the way back down into the buildings, you can have a restroom right there at the ready for children. Um, we have a pond and a waterfall and an outcrop or an amphitheater um, where we can have performances. And we have a lot of music here up at Tower Hill. Um, stumpery things, and to the left of the stumpery here, um, this is what we call a twig glue affectionately, but it's a stick, um, kind of an igloo, if you will, that kids love to run through. And in the middle of it, there's an opening where they stop and take pictures. And then finally on the lower left here is a stone stacking area. And it's just a wonderful new place for kids to enjoy, but really we see adults enjoying it as well. Tucked in all of these places are little tiny, um, you can see little circles here and here where we put tiny little rocking chairs or just little spaces where kids can gather and we do uh, book readings and being that you're library patrons, you'd be interested in that. It's just a wonderful new place for us to um, attract people and to program, particularly for children. And I see a question. What's the difference between a botanic garden and a botanical garden? Great question. There is not any difference. It is the same thing. It's just a, a word choice. But we are a botanic garden. Okay. Why is it my slide? Okay. Um, this is a close up of the twigaloo on the upper left there. Uh, when it was first constructed that those twigs are woven into a steel structure. And down below, you can see a little pullout version of that. These kids climb up on what look like rocket ships here. Here, these are um, stumps, the back end of a, a tree where you can see all of the roots. And if you were to look at it really close, embedded in there are rocks and debris uh, that came from the earth and their teaching opportunities for children. Um, not very often we can stare at the underside of a tree and understand what the root system looks like. This is the pond here. When it was first opened on the opening weekend, it was one of the hottest weekends and kids were literally standing in the 18 inches of water. Since then, we've planted it with beautiful water lilies and other plants that, you know, we have frogs in there and it's just a wonderful place. Right behind it is the waterfall. So it's a peaceful place to sit. There are benches around the edge of it. Um, and you can see another angle here looking back at the, the pavilion. You see story time up in the ramble with one of our staff members, you know, when we first built this, we pictured kids sitting on this, listening to stories and look, you see, they make of it what they will. They're jumping around on the rocks here. Um, and just other pictures of, of the, um, the ramble and the boardwalk leading up to it. What factors came under consideration when planning the changes such as climate change? Yes, we care very much about those things and Sustainability is a huge factor in anything that we do. Universal design and accessibility is also a huge factor. Our next new garden right next to the Ramble will be a climate victory garden for children, which will be a teaching tool for them about um, climate science and sustainability. Okay. So here you see uh, just various pictures of the garden, that little um, opening that I talked about in the middle of the twig glue that kids like to pop out of and get pictures taken, um, a wicked wing in the middle, and um, one of our turtles in our winter garden. Um, we have two facing each other, spitting at each other. They're a lot of fun. But you can see that we're more and more attracting children to the garden, um, and it is a place, again, for all. So our collections involve both cultivated wild collections. We have a huge daffodil field that comes up in the spring um, and is just a sea of yellow and white and, and gorgeous. Uh, we have a natural pond with an overlook here with many um, uh, wonderful plants and trees around that. 
And uh, our inner park here, we have quite a few paths through the woods. We have 100 or 1.5 miles of path through the woods. So it's not just um, our formal gardens, but you can go out into the woods. And, and our lower left here is a shade garden, often overlooked by visitors. Uh, we are in process of putting up a lot of wayfinding signs so that people will not overlook the shade garden, but this is absolutely one of my favorite places in the whole garden. Little also known is that we have two rather large vegetable gardens and an apple orchard. Thing, two things about that, um, the design of the vegetable garden changes every year. One of our most experienced horticulture staff, Dawn Davies, who's been here for 23 years, spends uh, the off season, if you will, um, designing her vegetable garden. And this year designed it with um, the idea that she put some very unusual uh, vegetables there and it's meant for sights and smells and certainly attracting um, pollinators as well. And we donate um, the proceeds of the vegetable garden to Friendly House in Worcester and another nonprofit so that they have fresh vegetables. And last year we donated 1200 pounds and I believe we're up to about 800 pounds yet and we're, we're not done for this year. We recently had a doubling of our vegetable garden and it is a very popular spot and inspired many people. And Dawn did a video recently and said, it's easy, anybody can do it. But of course she's an experienced gardener. Um, our horticulture staff is 15 people and you saw in the video that we have many volunteers. We could not do this without our volunteers relative to the amount of property we have, 17 and a half acres of formal gardens, and 171 acres total, we could not maintain this property without uh, the support of our volunteers. Our apple orchard has been restored recently. It suffered uh, blight and uh, rather than use pesticides to fix that, um, it was decided to take it down. It was um, reconstituted. There's a, a farmer in Maine who helped reconstitute the um, over, I think, 75 varieties. And we, two, a year ago, March, replanted um, the apple orchard. And we have 100 and, over 150 trees in the orchard. And they can be seen as you drive up the property. They won't produce apples for probably about another year. But uh, we're thrilled with how we cre recreated the apple orchard without using any pesticides. Our formal gardens are um, up on the upper left here, the garden within reach, which looks very different today. Each year it's planted out differently, but the purpose of the garden within reach is so that it's accessible to all. And it is planted at a height, you can see here, it's wheelchair height, but it also is child height and has sort of a gradation up. Um, the sights and the sounds and the smells of this garden are very important, as well as the patterns that you can see. And the last slide that I'm going to show you will illustrate that. You saw in the video our trustee, Liz Miska, who is sight impaired, um, works on this garden with her um, cohort of, of um, friends and helpers. So we have a basin that the sight impaired uh, plant every year. And it's a touch garden, so you can, you know, it's meant to be felt and smelled and so forth. Um, and that's really important to us because, again, we're trying to say to everybody, everybody is welcome. There's a place for everybody uh, here. Oops, let me go back one. Nope, oh, forward, sorry. On the upper right here is the interior of one of our conservatories during our um, orchid exhibition. Uh, called prismatic. And you can see that there's some prism, prisms here and a giant prism in the middle and tucked in there were all these orchards. That's in the middle of the winter where we attracted so many visitors because it's beautiful and it's warm. And on Friday nights, we had jazz music playing and um, food and it was just lovely, you know, for a nice date night or just to get away in the middle of um, February, March, 
to get in uh, in a nice, beautiful place where you can see plants. On the lower left here is our secret garden. This is where, under the pergola or down below, where our weddings are. We attract every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we have weddings here uh, during the late spring and summer. And when you have a wedding here, you get the whole property, which is really great. I sometimes work on Friday night, you know, a little late on Friday nights as I'm walking out, the wedding party is walking in. It's very exciting. Um, and then on the lower right is our garden of inspiration. So built to inspire gardeners to work on their home gardens. So community engagement, I mentioned um, the garden within reach and just a little bit more about that. Um, it's a learning environment as well. And we do have volunteers here who help us with that, but we also have great staff that work on our, um, our programs to get people to interact with our plant collection here. So education and programs, we have many, including adult education. We run a lot of seminars. We use outside speakers and sometimes our own staff to teach about a variety of classes. You can go, our, go to our website to see some of our upcoming programs, but we have everything from um, botanic, uh, how to make drinks botanically, um, mushroom class recently, yoga, uh, you name it, we do it, forest bathing, uh, and anything anybody wants to bring to our attention, if they think it would be a great program, our staff is very excited to, to take that on. The question is, is the entire place accessible by wheelchair? And um, Technically, yes, but we're working on some areas that we feel that we could really do a better job of making a smoother um, opportunity for people to get around. We also offer um, uh, golf cart uh, tours for folks that cannot maybe feel comfortable getting out into the wood uh, trails out in the woods. Um, limited vision, I would recommend um, the Garden Within Reach uh, for sights and sounds there because it's really a touch garden. Youth education has expanded rapidly over the past few years. We now, we went from one to three staff members and we are attracting many, many students. In fact, we have a project program called Project Leap, which attracts um, every second grader in public schools in the city of Worcester comes through for uh, a field trip to the garden every year. So, our goal is to attract nature's next generation of the nature's stewards and make sure that everybody has an opportunity to get out in nature and experience the beauty of it and, and that we teach them something when they're here. We have, um, we started with something called the Refugee Assistance Program where we had a group of refugees from Burma and we've expanded that to work with several nonprofits in Worcester um, for disadvantaged youth. And now we have six groups that are coming here for six week programs and they get to kind of choose from a menu of items. We provide transportation as well. So um, that is something that we received a grant for and is a wonderful program that we uh, run. We have art exhibitions. You're looking at these wonderful flowers. Those are made of recycled grocery bags. Um, kind of funny to have recycled grocery bag flowers at a place where we have real flowers, but I can tell you my old office used to overlook that particular display last summer and it was the most visited place at the time. We know when we have exhibitions, that's one excuse for maybe people who are not as familiar with botanic gardens to come and look at the art. And when they're here, they discover so much more. So we give people lots of reasons to show up here. We have many, many public events. Um, we have Diwali celebration. We just had pride celebration. We have every Thursday night in the summer, we have beer gardens with live music. For our members, we have um, summer concerts on our lawn. We have webinars for our members. We are always trying to bring the garden out to people or get people to come to the garden and frankly say thank you to those who support us uh, best. I'm sorry, it moved on its own. Um, we have interpretation uh, for anybody that needs that. 
Um, we're working on our signage and getting better at that. And again, I mentioned the tours by, you can walk the tours. We have the, the um, golf cart tours. People can volunteer. We do go through a slightly rigorous intake for our volunteers to make sure it's a good match and that we place you in the place that you wanna be and that you can be most helpful. We cannot have enough volunteers, frankly. Um, and we take on summer interns as well. They do a lot of outreach work in the community. We plant quite a bit of trees and gardens even um, in the city of Worcester. Worcester lost over 300,000 uh, trees during um, an infestation of the Asian, Asian longhorn beetle. And we've been working uh, what was used to be called the Worcester Tree Initiative. We've been working with them to replant trees at one point, many, many, and now um, about a hundred a season we do. And we give trees away to residents who want to plant trees. We want trees planted in the city. And we even did a program on South Main Street in Worcester where we had oversized planters that we weren't gonna use and we brought them into the business district there and planted trees and flowers and worked with the business owners there on the upkeep of that. And I mentioned the um, outreach education for children already. So our adult education, um, you can learn how to do things. You can do flower arrangement. We have lectures, workshops. It can be hands-on. You can sit and listen. We do it in-person webinars, um, gardening, floral design, horticultural therapy, wellness. We do a lot of different things here. Again, we're trying to attract as many people as possible, but also immerse people in the different ways that you can interact with horticulture. Um, the golf court cart tours are not extra. Um, they are included in the admissions fee and they, I don't remember exactly when they run. I know we do them every week, uh, I believe on either Tuesday or Thursday, Thursday mornings around 10 or 11 o'clock. And you can contact the garden directly and sign up for those tours. Um, we went years before my mother-in-law's knee surgery and it was very difficult for her. Yes, this is a huge improvement, but yes. And we know that the chairs would have been a, a, a barrier. And I can say this too, that um, you know we have wheelchairs on site. So if you arrive here, we have limited wheelchairs, but um, if you arrive here and you're in need of one, we can certainly help you out with that. We're, we're constantly thinking about how to improve accessibility and we'll be, even changing out our lovely brick walkway around our lawn garden, which looks great, but the bricks heave in the weather and uh, they're a tripping hazard. They're not welcoming for wheelchairs or people with mobility issues. Um, youth education, I've gone over that, but um, again, field trips for groups and schools. We have boy and Girl Scout troops who come here, family classes. We have whole families arrive here. Um, and you know, are walking in the woods, identifying things, capturing butterflies. We do uh, night um, uh, walks through the, the woods. It's just really a wonderful place for whole families, but especially children to get excited about nature and plants and learn. Our community outreach for kids, I mentioned how we're working with the city of Worcester, but really all under resourced communities in greater Worcester so that we can bring kids here and that we're not, there's not a barrier for them to come and, and experience what everybody and anybody would want to experience the beauty and the learning here. Um, because we believe in learning about climate change and environmental justice, we know if we can um, introduce that early on, that we're going to be um, educating and informing many, many more stewards of, of nature going forward. And in some cases, preparing people for and introducing people for um, careers in this field, which can only help. Just some fun exhibitions that we do. On the upper left here, you see these giant gnomes. This We have gnome vember upcoming where we'll have giant painted gnomes. We just did a um, contest among artists to paint these gnomes. We gave them resources plus the gnome to paint. Um, and then we'll have our tiny gnomes around the garden as well. It's very popular for 
for kids to go hunting for them. Yarn storm, you see in the next photo down on the left, that literally is that things around the garden, whole benches um, were knitted over. <laughs> Super cool. That's when I started here um, in February of 2020. And it was just wild with color against the snow. Wicked Wings, I mentioned. Um, and then uh, George Sherwood, we do have a George Sherwood sculpture here permanently, but we have displayed his work. He has wonderful sculptures. Uh, that's on the upper right you see there. Currently we have Uprooted, which is land art by Gary Smith. And Gary is also the architect of the uh, designer of um, the Ramble, our newest garden. Starting this week, we have the Enchanted Forest on the lower right there, you see one of our fairy houses. So we're gonna have fairy Fridays. Um, starting this Friday and going forward. And um, those are a chance to come here at night with the garden, new ramble all lit up. I was up there yesterday checking out all the little fairy houses. They are so darling, um, all handcrafted by Sally Smith. And they're just a kind of a wonderful delight. We have programs on the weekends as well. You can come anytime when we're open and take a look at the fairy houses. You don't just have to show up on Friday nights. And of course, our most popular exhibition and attraction is our night lights, which takes place in December. And I believe we're going to be even open on New Year's Eve this year. I might work that because I usually don't have plans on New Year's Eve. So better to be here with fun crowds. We're in a good mood. But that's when we light up about four or five gardens. And it's a nighttime activity. We have bonfires. You can get s'mores. It um, is such a popular ticket to get. We first offer it to our members and then in turn give our members a 40% discount on those nightlight tickets. They get two weeks advance notice and purchase opportunity ahead of the general public. Again, back to why we doubled our parking lots. We want to invite more people into our wonderful displays and events. We recently had our second swearing in ceremony a naturalization ceremony. Um, see if you can find me in this picture right here. <laughs> uh, but at this one, this was a year ago in the summer, we had people representing 21 countries and that expanded this year. And then we gave them passes to come back and visit us. We do see quite of a di diverse crowd from different countries. I'm out and about talking to people. And what I notice is that people from um, all over the world come to see us, but even people who have immigrated here uh, come to see us because we don't have just uh, native plants. We have great collections representing plants from other countries as well. So we do outreach into the community. I wanted to let you know, I know we're representing at least three communities of Ashland, Tewksbury and Lexington today. Wanted to let you know that we give out awards for beautification of your communities that could be um, in this case, in Shrewsbury, the, the Garden Club uh, beautified their town center. Uh, and we have other um, awards for things like um, public green spaces, pollinators, even best business. Um, you know, we want things to be green and beautiful out in the community. Uh, so in this case, the Unitary, Unitarian Universalist Church of Worcester um, created a rain garden. And we give those awards out in the spring at our or in June in our at our annual meeting, and we invite you um, onto the property to be publicly recognized. But the comment is, "You're doing amazing things." This was an eye opener. We'll have to come back. <laughs> well, that's the point: is that we know we are, and we just want to tell as many people as possible. This is in the garden within reach. And this is a wall um, that gets so many comments, so many selfies. I, you know, I have to walk from the farmhouse into the um, Stoddard Education Center right by this and often interrupting people posing in front of it. But this, you know, you might take for granted, oh, they put some plants in a wall. But I can tell you that the gentleman who designed this did so for the contrast for the sight impaired. Um, did it for the touch and the feel and the smell of it. So what I'm saying is that our horticulturists take great care and great time to design what it is you see. 
particularly those gardens that turn over. They're very dedicated to the work that they do here and it shows. Um, again, we, we always would love more volunteers to help us maintain the wonderful things that they do design because there are only 15 of them. And uh, we wish we had more help um, because it's a lot of property to take care of and we want it to look beautiful for everybody. This just represents some of our woodland trails um, headed out to our inner park. And um, I just thank you for listening. And I would take any questions. I know I've been answering them as I've gone along, but if you have any more and want to put them in the chat, um, I'd love to take them. Uh, you mentioned Worcester residents can purchase trees. Actually, we give the trees away. Are there any opportunities for non-residents to purchase trees or plants? So yes, um, we have a get a tree uh, program here. And so if you contacted us, contacted me, I can put you in touch with our outreach manager. We're interested in anybody planting trees. I've um, had, I'm from Northboro. I've had residents of Northboro ask for trees. I've given them trees to plant. It's about planting trees. And if you visit here, yes, you can buy plants um, in our garden shop. But um, after the orchid exhibition, we had an orchid uh, plant sale and we have plant sales sometimes here periodically. We have plant shows, we have plant exhibitions of you name it, it dahlias, you know, um, they happen throughout the year. The orchid sale, first we let in our staff and our, I believe our volunteers and right after that, the general public. And I was the last staff member to come out the door uh, and they said, hurry, hurry, hurry. And I walked out and the line <laughs> went right through our Stoddard Center. There probably were 150 people in line, very, very popular. Um, and I had a full box with me and I said, don't worry, there are plenty more in there. Um, just gorgeous orchids. We use, so uh, the question is, do you have a horticultural library? Um, we no longer have a horticultural library. We had, we have a limited library. And um, we had, um, we deaccessioned the library, a lot of the collections in the library because it wasn't getting a lot of use. And we had a need for that space with our growing staff um, for administrative space, which we'll be renovating. We do have a limited library for our horticulture staff, but you'll be happy to know that we shared Many of those collections with local libraries, um, Holy Cross comes to mind, so that um, some of the collections are still accessible in the area. We were careful to do that as well. Um, as someone who needs to use a wheelchair for any outings, it's very exciting to learn how about how accessible the garden is, and I can't wait to visit. Thank you, I learned a lot. Excellent, and your name is Teresa, no H. I love it. Um, how much focus do you put on encouraging people to grow native uh, plants and stress the importance of encouraging pollinators on properties? Yes, um, we wholly encourage growing native plants, less invasive species, and we definitely are encouraging um, planting pollinators. I visited a garden in my town. Uh, there's a gentleman in my town who took over a space a public space and has, is growing a pollinator garden with for rare uh, bee species that are going extinct. There's a professor at UMass Dartmouth that has a whole program in that and actually lists out plants that you can plant to help with that. And this, I learned when I visited that uh, many communities around here have pollinator gardens and many of our members um, have pollinator gardens or try. It's not just on our property that the effort is uh, put forth. You know, we have members with spectacular gardens that on, from time to time our volunteers or our board members say, come see our gardens. And they're very thoughtful about what they plant and we encourage that. I love visiting Tower Hill. Thank you for a wonderful informative program on the Friends of the Library. On behalf of the Friends of the Library, you're welcome. It's exciting to be able to share, um, you know, what goes on here. Uh, again, I live 13 minutes away and didn't come here enough uh, when my kids were growing up, I, they're now in college, because there wasn't this level of programming to attract 
kids and family. This is relatively new over the last five years. Grace Elton as our CEO has just really revolutionized what goes on here. And when she says we're a garden for all, she is bound and determined to be that. You know, all it takes is resources. It's not our plans or thoughts. It's the resources to get it done. Those are human, financial, as you can imagine, um, to make all of the dreams happen and to truly be a place where anybody can come visit and enjoy being in nature. That was wonderful. I just have one question. What's your favorite attraction at the New England Botanical Garden? Um, I have two. I, I mentioned earlier the Shade Garden because it's sort of it's hidden in plain sight in the woods, and it has um, paper bark. Uh, I think it's paper bark ma maple trees in there, and they beautiful copper colored maple trees that the bark is sort of um, just kind of sliding off of it, and I just love the look of it. Uh, it's, just, it's gorgeous. And for our programming, I think it is uh, night lights because it does attract so many people who otherwise I think um, would not show up here. You know, it, it in some ways is a shame. We get many, many people that that's their first time ever coming here. But then when they see what is here, you know, they get very excited and say, we have to come back. And I always say, you know, please come back in, in different weather You'd see each season, each day, good, literally each day, something changes here. We just finished our giving week and our theme was there's always more to explore. Oh, I should tell you, we have, we have a tails and trails program too. You can bring your dogs here. The only limitation is um, they can't go in the cafe and the garden shop for obvious reasons, but they can cut through the buildings to get into some of the, um, the gardens that we have here. And it's just a wonderful addition to, um, you know, to our membership that people can bring their dogs and many people do. And we do have strict policies about the dogs. You have to clean up after them. You have to keep them on leash. And we don't have any issues. We've never had any issues with dogs that I'm aware of. Um, we would certainly hear about it. Non-members can bring dogs, but, but have to pay for their dogs to come in. Um, so, you better be better off getting a Tails and Trails membership. I think it's uh, $25 added on to any of the memberships. And then it's unlimited when you can bring your dogs. Um, Ken says, I visited last Saturday and wanted to mention that I really enjoyed it. I'm a native plant enthusiast and a member of Native Plant Trust. Wonderful. I like that you have a mix of horticulture varieties and native plants, and of course, the tropical plants. The new Ramble is great for adults and kids. You really have done a great job of the place that walk up to the front gate. It took 10 minutes to get up the walk, just looking at all the plants, yes. And it is a slight incline. I'm not going to, to lie there, Ken, you know that. Um, so take your time. We do have um, handicap spots right near the entrance. And again, um, you can drop people off there. Um, we get feedback from people all the time about our accessibility. Um, what we could improve, and we take that very seriously. I know we talk about that weekly. Um, oh, the chat is disabled, so Jessica is dropping it in here. We offer reciprocal admission to the American Horticultural Society member gardens, not AAM. The ferry program is going on now. Um, either you can come on the Friday nights for the really special events, a um, little extra fee if you're a member uh, for that program, but you can come by day and check out what's going on. I know last weekend I was here and they were having events during Saturday for children uh, for the ferry houses up in the Ramble. Uh, but you can just come and walk through and see all of the cute little ferry houses. Oh. Um, and then just the last question about discount on price for seniors. Yes, we do. Uh, Jessica, I believe it is a 15% discount for seniors. We also have, if you're a member of AARP, um, you can get in for free on Tuesdays during this month. Um, and they have a table here every Tuesday to tell you about their programs, but they have sponsored an opportunity for AARP members to come in every Tuesday, which is great. Wonderful. Well, thank you again, Teresa, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Take care. Bye, everybody.